Good morning, everyone. Let us worship God together. Let us worship a God of surprises. Too often we are told that winning is everything. Too often we believe that freedom means autonomy, that we are in charge of our own lives. Too often, we are told that we are what we have, that wealth reigns and power rules. Let us worship a God of surprises. Let us prepare our hearts to hear God's startling good news once again. I am our hymn of adoration this morning is All Creatures of God and King.
Let us pray. We are grateful, gracious God, for the gift of belonging to you. We see the hurts, the poverty, the injustice, and the violence that mars your world. And we know that, in your, know that your heart is broken. We thank you for the high calling to care, respond and give to meet the needs and ease the suffering of people you love so much. Lord, hear our prayer in the name of your son who taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our gifts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 91, 1 through 14. You who live in the shelter of the Most High who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, For he will deliver you from the snare of the hunter and from the deadly pestilence. And under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and defense. Those who love him, he will deliver. He will protect those who know his name. Let's take a few seconds to greet everyone this morning and those who watch us on YouTube. Good morning. Hello. Have a nice day. Okay, um, our mission for September is one great hour of sharing, and we also have our ongoing food collection for the town's food pantry at St. Mary of the Bay. Walkabout Warren will be three Sundays in October, the 16th, the 23rd, and the 30th. We will be hosting Atwater Donnelly Band on the lawn from noon to two, and inside if it rains. Our annual craft fair put on by the Benevolent Baptist Society is on Sunday, October 16th. And of course, we know everyone puts the offering in the plate at the top of the stairs. Does anyone have any prayer concerns at this time? Priscilla? Anyone else? Everyone's good. Okay, and I also have to pray that Rick and Esther make it home safely. Okay. Let us be in the spirit of giving as we give our offerings to the Lord. This is Mark. He loves to help others. It's part of his everyday life. Nothing makes him happier than taking an hour out of his day to give to someone in need. That's why when he hears a disaster has happened, he wants to be the first to help out. Even if he can't go himself. Like when a tornado hits the Midwest and thousands of lives are devastated, one great hour of sharing shines a ray of hope with the help of people who give. Like Mark, we can send specially trained experts, supplies, and support to put a community back on its feet again. But it all starts with a decision to give. Will you give to One Great Hour?
Let us pray. Creator God, you have gifted us with a beautiful and abundant world in which we live. You have also gifted us with the responsibility of being stewards of your creation. We acknowledge that and all that we have is yours and we return now a portion to you. Accept our tithes and offerings, we pray, as our grateful response to your generosity is with us. Amen. Our hymn of worship this morning is Lord of Life and King of Glory. Be seated. I think it's time to turn the heat on in here. What do you think? <laughs> anyway, our reading is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, verse 1 through 3a, and 6 through 15. Jeremiah buys a field during a siege. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of King Zedekiah of Judah was, which was the 18th year of, oh boy, Nebuchadnezzar. Thank you. <laughs> At the time of the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. And the prophet Jeremiah was confined in court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah where King Zedekiah of Judah was confined, had confined him. Zedekiah had said, Why do you prophesy and say? Thus says the Lord, I am going to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of Uncle Shalom, 
is going to come to say to you and say, by my field that is at Anathoth, Anathoth, for a right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, by my field that is at Anathoth, and in the land of Benjamin, for the right of the possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field in Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the silver to him, six, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the silver on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed to purchase a Bar to Baruch, son of Nariah, son of Mas Masiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of the witness who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard, in, the pres in their presence I charged Barak, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthware jar, earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Thank you, Michael. No. What does this text say? In the passage, Jeremiah is ex exercising his right under covenant law to take possession of a plot of ground that belongs to his family's Nahala, or inherited land. In the looming shadow of the inevitable capture of the capital city, Jeremiah's family members appear to be abandoning their property and other holdings. When Jeremiah's first cousin, Hanamel, offers him the right of redemption of his land, Jeremiah accepts. What a partial scene it must have seemed to onlookers. A prisoner in a city that is about to fall to the enemy goes through the elaborate legal rituals only to spend what little money he has to buy a piece of property that would surely be confiscated by the enemy as soon as the city fell. In addition to drawing up the contract, securing the witnesses, and carefully weighing out the payment, However, Jeremiah does one other seemingly futile thing. He asks his assistant Baruch to place both copies of the deed and his own open copy in a jar for long-term safekeeping, sealing both the copies inside the jar, which itself could have had cord and clay deep seal securing the lid, would have would ensure that the fragile medium on which they were written would not decompose and the record of sale be lost. This elaborately staged purchase of Hanimal's field, however, was obviously not merely a financial transaction. By carefully preserving the deeds in such a way, Jeremiah is testifying that he would certainly one day want that record of sale, even that day were a hundred years off. After all, God had a long decreed that Jeremiah and his family, having repented from the infamous corruption, would be allowed to live once again on the land originally promised to them.
Let us pray. We confess, O oh God, that sometimes we see the world with half-opened eyes. We see the beauty of your creation, but fail to be careful stewards of the earth to preserve it for those to come. We hear the laughter of children, but fail to hear the cry of children in lands far away. We taste the bounty of the harvest, but do not volunteer at the homeless shelter. We delight in the salty ocean air, but neglect to clean up the trash left on our beaches. Open our eyes fully to your word, O oh God. When we hear slander, give us courage to speak truth. When we witness persecution, grant us strength to defend the oppressed. Where we see grief, enable us to bring comfort. And with your grace, bless those of us who are unable to be here and those who need your blessings the most. For our former pastor, Esther, and her husband, Rick, that they have a safe home trip home back to New Mexico. For Scott Amy, Priscilla's husband, who will be going under cancer treatments starting next week in October. And for Mike's brother-in-law, John, who lost his sister, Kathy. Help us to see not only what is, but also what could be. Let us look to the hand of our master to make your kingdom come. We pray in the name of the one who sees us fully as we are and loves us still. Amen. I hem a petition, there shall be showers of blessing.
Yes, we need the showers, and I understand we're going to get them later on today. This morning's scripture text comes from 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 19, the good fight of faith. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faithful and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which we were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of, Jesus, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Most people want to live comfortably, comfortably but how much is enough? Nasedrin Haja was a a wise fool, clever simpleton, or inconstructive prankster, was born in what is now Turkey in the 13th century and quickly developed a strong reputation as a quick wit and a man not to be fooled with, even though he was a fictional character of the Muslim world. He was loved by the common people for putting rich people in their place, his humor and trickery, but most but mostly for poking holes in pompous windbags. The word haja and it is an horrific, honorific meaning scholar or teacher. One of the stories told about haja concerns a beggar. This hobo of sorts was given a piece of bread, but no butter, jam, or sauce to put it on. Hoping to get something to go with his bread, he went to a nearby inn and asked for a handout. The innkeeper turned away with nothing, turned him away with nothing, but the beggar sneaked into the kitchen where he saw a large pot of soup cooking over the fire. He held his piece of bread over the steaming pot, hoping to, catch, hoping to thus capture a bit of flavor from the good smelling vapor. You try this today and the police will come. <laughs> Suddenly the innkeeper seized him by the arm and accused him of stealing soup. I took no soup, said the beggar. I was only smelling the vapor. Then you must pay for the smell, answered the innkeeper. The poor beggar had no money, so the in angry innkeeper dragged him before the cardi, which is a judge in Islamic countries. Now, Nazdan Hoja was at a time serving as cardi, and he heard the innkeeper's complaint and the beggar's explanation. So you demand payment for the smell of your soup? Summarized the Hodger after the hearing. Yes, insisted the innkeeper. Then I will, myself will pay you, said the Hodger. 
and I will pay you for the smell of your soup with the sound of money. The Haji drew two coins from his pocket, rang them together loudly, and put them back into his pocket, and sent the beggar and the innkeeper each on his own way. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, writes the apostle. What else but showing the love of money can explain the showing of extreme greed for wealth, more material gain by the shopkeeper would want to charge a poor beggar for the smell of his broth. In verse seven of the text, the apostle recalls the words of Job, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there for the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 1 verse 21. Paul writes, we brought nothing to the world so that we could take nothing out of it. Put it another way, there's no trailer hitch on a hearse. We need a paycheck. All of this is true, but we can't live without money, can we? After all, we need a paycheck. We need to put food on our TV trays, no argument. We came into the world empty-handed, and we shall leave empty-handed. But we can't survive empty-handed in the interim. We need to cultivate the skills necessary to survive. Men engaged in the cultivation of land societies were taught at a young age to hunt, use an ax, fish, farm, and yoke a pair of oxen. Women learned to skin the hides, erect shelters, cook the food, gather herbs, bring in a harvest, and bear another generation of workers. In urban life emerged shopkeepers, cobblers, tinsmiths, artisans, bookkeepers, autocrats, politicians, writers, philosophers, and others plied their trades. Clearly, some professions were more lucrative than others. As this was happening, spiritual leaders, including the Apostle Paul, realized that the need to earn a living was fraught with potential problems. If one was too wealthy, others might yearn to possess your possessions and even steal what they could. Envy might cause some souls to work harder than necessary. Those who were employers might prefer to see their employees starve rather than give them a decent wage. Careers are sometimes judged based on the earnings they provide when they ought to be evaluated in terms of the service they offer. A teacher, one could argue, has more intrinsic value to this society than a football player. How true it is. Some professions are just wrong, as most people would agree. Prostitutes, drug pushers, jewel thieves, crooks, etc. No reasonable person would consider these activities a, as a real profession. Today's narrow text, the discussion of two money, specifically the acquisition of money, the benefits of money, and the dangers of extreme greed of wealth. Paul reminds us that Christians are not just a peculiar cohort of citizens who value spirituality, worship, and Judeo-Christian ethics. They also need to earn a paycheck. Spirituality is otherworldly. Earning a living is very worldly. And to do it successfully, one must be ambitious, work hard, train, and develop one's skills. But do it without sacrificing moral and ethical values. But not everyone is capable of this. Why? The love of money gets in the way. People like this cannot be content with food and clothing in verse eight, but rather are vulnerable to the temptation to acquire more than they need. The Bible says that there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. So the questions are, what are the bare essentials? And 
with how little can we be content? Show me the money. Money talks, true, and it usually says goodbye. I know mine does. In his book, Whistling in the Dark, an ABC theolo theologist, pre read a preacher and novelist and public theologian, Frederick Butchner noted, the more you think about money, the less you understand it. The paper it's printed on isn't worth a red cent. There was a time you could take it to the bank and get gold or silver for it, but all you get now is a blank stare. Money has worth only if there is enough for everybody. It has worth only because the government declares it has worth and because people trust the government in that one particular, although in every other particular, they wouldn't trust it around the corner. Great fortunes can be made and lost completely on paper. There are other people who used up their entire lives making money so that they can enjoy their lives they have entirely used up. The reality is that there is always going to be someone wealthier than you, and there are countless millions who are poorer than you. Do we need a 450 million yacht like Jeff Bezos? No, we might not be able to live without spending 4,500 on a pontoon fishing boat. Do we need a boat? Maybe, it's all relative. If you make $14,500, are you poor? Not if you live in India, for example, where their per capita income is just north of $2,000. But in the United States, if you're making $14,500 per annum, you are living in an abject poverty, according to Remember the Poor website. If you made 1500 last year, you're in the top 20% of the world's income earners. If you have sufficient food, decent clothes, live in a house or an apartment, and have reasonable means of transportation, you are among the top 15% of the world's wealthy. Have $61,000 in assets, you're among the richest 10 people, richest 10% of the adults in the world. If you have any money saved, a hobby that requires some equipment or supplies, a variety of clothes in your closet, two cars in any condition, and live in your own home, you're in the top 5% of the world's wealthy. If you have more than 500,000 in assets, you are part of the richest 1% of the world. Does this help you to be content with what you have, perhaps. Unfortunately, we live in a culture of outrage and discontent. It's very difficult to be truly at peace with ourselves and content with what we have. Sometimes it's hard to feel blessed. Jesus had what social theologians call a preferential option for the poor, maybe because it's because he, he himself was poor. He didn't own a house. He had no stocks listed on the Jerusalem Stock Exchange. He didn't even have transportation. He did have a trade, but when the disciples knew him, he wasn't gainfully employed. Jesus, truth be told, wasn't the sort of fellow we'd hang out with today. He's sort of unsavory and shiftless. But Jesus had a soft spot for the poor, showing love and compassion toward those on the bottom rungs of society, including the sick, the outcast, and those whom others considered sinners. Is Jesus asking us to live as he did? And neither is the Apostle Paul. The biblical consensus concerning personal wealth is that we should decide what we need, be content with that, and give away the rest. But how should we live? This is the question posed by the late moral and cultural theologian and founder of the Labrie Fellowship, Francis Schaeffer, 
in his book, How, Sh How Should We Then Live? The Rise and Decline of Western Thought and Culture. His life was devoted to responding to this question, and he did so in a number of ways and in other books, such as his tome, The Mark of a Christian. Schaefer reminded us that biblical orthodoxy without compassion is surely the ugliest thing in the world, and that Jesus taught that the mark of the Christian is the observable love shown among all true believers. This provides a clue how we should come to terms with the tension that exists between the need to survive, for which a paycheck is necessary, and the thirst or lust to acquire more than we need. Schaefer and Jesus and the Apostle Paul argue that our actions must be guided by compassion. Consider the following if you're well off in today's market and economy. One, be humble. You had luck, privilege, advantages, options, and opportunities that millions in the world can only dream of, even if you worked your tail off to get where you are. Humility goes a long way. The Bible says, as for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty, in verse 17. Two, be realistic. There are no guarantees. The market may crash tomorrow, and it possibly could. Who could have predicted the coronavirus and measured economic and its measured, income, measured its economic impact? If you practiced a policy of contentment, you were in a better position to weather this storm and any that may come in the future. Your peace and stability are not tied to your financial situation. Number three, be generous. We live in a sharing economy. Be a part of it. Join forces with local charities. Be creative in the methods by which you can generously distribute your assets among those who need a helping hand. And four, be faithful. Watch for any signs that you are starting to love money. This is the root of everything that can go wrong in your life. Instead of lusting after riches, grow your thirst for righteousness. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. In his seminal work, Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, moving from affluence to generosity, Professor Ron Sider conf confronts us with an inconvenient truth. God's word teaches us a very hard, disturbing truth. Those who neglect the poor and the oppressed are really not God's people at all. No matter how frequently they practice their religious rituals, nor how orthodox they are, they are their creeds and confessions. Okay then, this sums it up. Even if you're a prosperity gospel preacher, it's difficult to argue with cider. The Apostle Paul would not. So be content with what you have and give away the rest with humility, generosity, and faithfulness. Amen. Our hymn of benediction this morning is Lord whose love through humble service.
as we leave today, let God has given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Unlocking every barrier of justice, hatred, greed, and pride that keeps people from Christ. Now and forevermore. Amen.